Assalamu alaikum, peace be with you. How are you, Shaykh? Alhamdulillah. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. Thank you for being on the Dean Show. Alhamdulillah, thank you for having me, inshallah. Please excuse me a little bit. I got a nice little cut over here. It was training, and I got a uh, knee to the face on accident. So I got a little bit busted up here. Alhamdulillah. Hopefully so it was an accident. It was, <laughs> it was an accident, yeah. <laughs> so still managed to make it here. I'm excited to be to have you as our guest here. 18 plus years experience here as an imam in the prison system. Also, yeah. you've helped over 2,000 families stay together. Yes, alhamdulillah. It's a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sometime whenever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants something good for you, he blesses you with an opportunity to do some good. And it's up to us you know, to take advantage of the opportunity that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala places there. So, you know, we have an opportunity to save the family. So that's what we dedicated our time and our life to, alhamdulillah. Yeah, we like to, at the Dean Show, highlight because you have, it's very sad that uh, mainstream media, they don't get out there and highlight a lot of the good that Muslims are contributing to towards society. Correct. Making the world a better place. So right, right. we like to do that. Right. Highlight some of the good work that yeah. Muslims are doing. And you're doing some astonishing uh, great work. I mentioned that. Is this true that institutions, why, why do you believe that Islam in the prison systems now, it is rapidly growing? Well, number one, you know, the majority of the people that are coming to the institution, you know, they're coming from, a, uh, you know, sad circumstances or they ran into bad situations in their life. And now whenever they, you know, have all of their activities cut out, they have an opportunity to sit and think and reflect and ponder about, you know, what is right and what is not. And then whenever they have an opportunity to see all of the different uh, avenues as far as uh, Christianity, and other uh, religions, Islam seems to uh, be the religion that stands out to them, you know, and makes more sense to them, you know. So you, you, now they can go towards any, any religion. All, basically in the prison system, you're behind four walls. Now all the things that might be distracting you, they're not distracting you. Correct. So now you can really contemplate, what's the purpose of life? Why exactly. am I here? Exactly. Now they hit the books, they start reading. Right, exactly. And they come to Islam. They come to Islam. You know, sometimes it's... Uh, through the one that comes in from outside of uh, the institution, like myself, when I started working in the uh, prison system. And then sometimes it's other uh, Muslims that may have gotten themselves in trouble, and then uh, they may share some information with them, and then they look into it. And uh, so there's a number of different reasons why they come, but you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one that makes Muslims, so whatever avenue is there, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala furnished the avenue. I just happen to be one of the avenues that uh, help to bring in, you know, quite a few Muslims into Islam. MashaAllah. Yeah. Is it true now you were mentioning that the actual, the institution, they actually, they like the Muslim presence there? Yeah, they don't necessarily 100% uh, like Muslims in general because there's a lot of prejudice against Muslims with all of the things that go on on television, the media and whatnot. But the reality is 99 and 9 tenths percent of those people who work in the institution, if they're truthful, they will say that the most uh, respected um, inmates are those who accept Islam and try to live it inside of the walls of the, uh, the prison. Why is that? Because Muslims, if they have a desire to try to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then that obligates them to live a certain way with good etiquettes and manners and to treat everybody who deserves being treated right, to treat them right, you know, and not just use them uh, or use a, a broad uh, bristled brush to paint everybody because maybe they made a mistake or somebody uh, abused them or misused them at some point in their life, whether or not it was a, a certain race or whether or not it was somebody from another religion. You know, they realize that they have to use uh, good judgment and they have to respect everyone who deserves being respected. So a Muslim should equal one with the noblest, best conduct, behavior, manners, He's, he's cleaned up his act now. He's being respectful even to the, to the guards, to the inmates. And, I mean, you would yeah, like, yeah. as opposed to, is it the, the, who runs the prison? Well, the, I mean, the, the administration runs the prison on paper. Yeah. But the reality is if you have one uh, officer with, uh, you know, 60 or 100 uh, inmates, the reality is if you look at it, you know, the, uh, the inmates basically run the prison as far as, uh, you know, what's going to happen at that particular point. 
So, you know, you, you look at that situation and realize that the majority of them are basically good people. They just made a lot of mistakes, you know. So it's up to us whenever we come in to try to articulate to them, you know, the best uh, way for them to try to clean up their life. So you'd want to be, if anything goes down, you want to be around the Muslim because the Muslims are going to be Correct. fair, balanced, and just and help save the day, not exactly. bring havoc exactly. to the day. Exactly, and that happens on a regular basis. Whenever there's, you know, any particular dorm or area in the prison, you know, in, in my experience, and uh, it's dangerous, you know, it's a dangerous environment, of course, but whenever you have a group of Muslims in one area, those Muslims generally don't want a lot of uh, drama and fitna or crime to go on in that particular area. So whenever something does happen, the Muslims are generally the ones who squash, you know, or uh, stop all of the problems that go in. So human being makes mistakes. Yeah. And now this individual maybe was the worst highway robber, car jacker, thief, whatever case. He yeah. comes in, now he learns about Islam. Yeah. Uh, instead of going back out and doing the same thing, he becomes one who submitted to the will of God. He knows the purpose of life now. He, he reforms his life. He becomes an upright, honest human being. Absolutely. This is what society wants. This is what we want. Absolutely. Absolutely. I have some that are in there for murder. You know, I have some that not just murder and just maybe shot or stabbed somebody, but I have some that did some things that I don't even want to, you know, mention on television, <laughs> you know, but... Uh, those right now are some of the best and the most trustworthy individuals that you would have them uh, spend time around yourself because you know that they have a love and a fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now. And God is the one, you know, who changes the heart. He's in total control of the heart. So it's not up to us to decide whether or not this person has changed. It's what God does, you know, and I've seen that and witnessed it close hand you know, in many times in the different prisons. And not only when you have a sincere love, fear of God in your, in your heart, in your mind, and your life starts to revolve around this belief in the Creator and want to pleasing mm -hmm. your Creator, that brings reformation. I mean, atheism is not going to change your life. You go in there as an atheist, stay an atheist. Most criminals go in there and they get a degree now in criminality. They become better criminals. Yeah. They don't come get yeah. out of reform. Yeah. But I'll do respect, you know, even... You know, Islam, the beauty about Islam is I know some, uh, some atheists and I know some, uh, you know, some of those ones who just uh, cannot stand even to talk about God that have accepted Islam because they've been around individuals, you know, and they've seen them to change their life. So they become curious and start asking questions about it. Mm -hmm. And in the different Muslims or myself at different times, you know, I've had a general conversation for instance, one individual, you know, um, I went by lockdown and I asked him, you know, did he need anything? And then he uh, cursed me out. So I stood there for a few minutes and then I said, listen, I said, I don't want to create any problem for you. I said, I just want to respect you as a man. I want you to respect me too. You know, so the best thing for you to do is just, you know, if I greet you, greet me back. If you greet me, I'll greet you back. So I walked down the uh, the walkway, and then I came back, and he apologized. Right now, he's one of the best Muslims in that institution. Amazing, amazing. Yeah. We, we have a lot more to talk about here on the Dean Show with Imam Khan. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. Back here on the Dean Show. Sheikh, tell us, have you ever been in, in the middle of a riot in the prisons where things have just gotten out of control and you were right in the middle of it? I was in the middle of... Uh, a situation where it possibly could have got real bad, mm -hmm. where two different groups, as a matter of fact, both of them were Muslims. One had one idea of what should be done, the other had another idea of what should be done, and all of them came with shanks or homemade or prison-made knives. And uh, my uh, intention was to not allow that to happen, and before I knew it, I jumped in the middle and I stopped both of them. Now you, you know? jumped and in the middle of I jumped of in the middle of them before they got to each other. Everybody was standing up, you know, I mean, kind of looking at each other, looking to, uh, to do some things, you know, to, to hurt each other. And I stopped, and then I started talking loud, telling everyone to go to the side. You go over there, take off those glasses, go sit down, you know. And I didn't realize that, you know, how bad of a situation it was until after it was over, you know. Mm -hmm. A few people got locked up you know, and everything was squashed. And on my way home, 
you know, I realized that, you know, it wasn't necessarily the smartest thing, but alhamdulillah, it helped because had there been some bloodshed at that particular time, then they would have cut out all of the meetings for the Muslims, yeah. and the Muslims were the ones that needed to really be able to move around the institution in order to bring, um, uh, you know, some type of uh, uh, peace, you know, and balance to the whole entire uh, 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 community in, uh, in the institution. All right, so you have that scenario. You have yeah. two sides, they're ready to come at each other, knives, shanks, yeah. Yeah. and the whole get up. Yeah. You're between it, you help calm it down. Right. Have you ever, ever betwe been between now two? Uh, another scenario, here's one. We got a husband and wife, <laughs> and things are about to blow up That's here. A, that's a regular basis. Right yeah, there. so talk yeah, to us and, about this. And, and uh, as a matter of fact, in many instances, in many ways, that's even worse than the, uh, yeah. in the prison system because everybody has a personal stake you know, in the other person, you know what I mean? And they know each other and they have more than likely just allowed uh, anger and whatnot to build for so long and maybe the rights of the other person was not being observed by the other person. So it can get very, uh, um, it can get very uh, 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 strong in those particular instances, yeah. So you, got, you must have a lot of experience. I mean, 2,000 plus families you've helped. I mean, this is over a span of how many years? We opened up in uh, 1999. 1999. Right. So since then, yeah. you can say, alhamdulillah, I think, creator of heavens and earth, that you were able yeah. to save over 2,000 families from Alhamdulillah, by way, of, by way of uh, personal counseling and conferences that we had, you know, that uh, we would de design the conferences strictly to uh, strengthen the Muslim family. As a matter of fact, the name of the conferences that we had, and we had six conferences, Strengthen the Muslim Family. And um, all of those were strictly to address issues that went on in the family, you know, between husband and wife and, and uh, parents and children, you know, and things of that nature. So, you know, with the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we designed every talk and every uh, breakout session and seminar that was going to be able to give each person that came, whether or not they were young or old, or had been married for a long time or a short time, or they were looking to get married, you know, we would always give them some kind of information that was going to benefit them because the ultimate goal was to bring them closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there's no way to get somebody closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than in the marriage bond, inshallah. Getting closer to the Almighty, to, yes. the, to the creator of all that exists, yes. directing them to that. and. Would you say that, I mean, this is obviously not your, your traditional behavioral marriage counseling, like the clinical, the, uh, this is different. Yeah the, diff uh, yeah, the difference between clinical counseling and Islamic counseling, clinical counseling basically deals with the mind, you know, how you feel, what you think, what's your opinion. That's but not that. The, this yeah, is, no, but not, Islamic counseling is based on the level of iman, the faith that you have, because if you say that you are a Muslim and you have a love for Allah, and you say that you fear Allah, fear displeasing Allah, and you have a hope that Allah will facilitate your life, then whenever someone brings you information that's based on what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said and what the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said and did, then uh, you will always try to do the right thing and change your behavior regardless how strong your feelings are toward that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what, what have you been, in your experiences, what do you see as one of the number one problems why these marriages get to the verge of divorce? Lack of understanding. You know, lack of understanding about the divine institution of marriage. It's one of the biggest institutions of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Marriage is ibadah, marriage is worship. The same way we line up for salat and we say this is ibadah, this is worship. You know, the same thing whenever we get married and we fulfill our obligation inside of the marriage as the husband, as the wife, you know, and the family member, you know, we have obligations to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, more than to our mate. So when people really understand that, you know, and they, you know, accept the fact that this is a, require, uh, a required action that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants for us to get married and to live, you know, in peace and, and have the love and the tranquility and the kindness, you know, and the tolerance and the patience inside of the marriage, you know, then it's going to bring you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because we are fulfilling what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from us. And the majority of people don't know it. They think that they're getting married, 
you know, just to that one person. You know, it's my wife, you know, your husband, and it's between you two, but it's bigger than that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so when you bring Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala into the fray, then you find out that, you know, you're able to fulfill your obligation and you're able to have that peace that Allah wants for you in the marriage. You know, and a lot of times it starts prior to you getting married. You know, how do you, you know, prepare yourself to find the right person? How do you find the right mate? What do you look for? You know, what is the things that, you know, is going to help you in the rest of your life? Because life is short. So you want to make a good decision so that whenever you do get married, you know, alhamdulillah, you're going to be able to uh, fulfill your obligation to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, and live in harmony with the person that you use Allah's name to make lawful to you. And you have a very interesting story to share with us how someone can start off r the right way, giving us an example so you don't become a chalk line. Yeah, I'm good. So we're right. going to tell them the chalk line story when we yeah, come yeah. back? Inshallah, inshallah. God willing, we'll be right inshallah. back with more here on The Dean Show. Don't go anywhere. Please subscribe to The Dean Show. Follow us on our official Facebook and Twitter pages in the links below. Please also help support The Dean Show by making a donation in the link below. Back here on The Dean Show. Thank you for tuning in. If you haven't subscribed already, subscribe right now and be up with all of the new shows of The Dean Show. Have you ever watched The Dean Show, Sheikh? I always watch The Dean <laughs> Show. That's why I'm here, Sheikh. <laughs> <laughs> MashaAllah. So helping to prevent a war in the prisons, and you were able to do that, and I'm sure not on one occasion, I'm sure on many, you, you did some wonderful work there, and they loved you there. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. And also now 2,000-plus families. And, and you mentioned something before we went to break, doing things the right way, doing yeah. things by the blueprint that was sent from the creator of creation, God Almighty, the creator of Allah, and even before so, and this is just one example that we can use for many because sometimes the, you know, we forget that God loves us the most, Allah loves us, he, he's, he's the one that we should trust in the most, and whatever yeah. he told us to do is for our benefit. Right, exactly. Now give, give this, uh, we mentioned this chalk story of when, because someone, there's a way also for a woman to be protected that she's got her, her yeah. bodyguard, right, you know, right. someone, her family member who's helped weeding out the rats. Well, her wali. Her, her wali. Her wali or the wakil. Exactly. Either one. Yeah, the wali is somebody in the family. Wakil is, is someone that does the same job, but they're not of the family. Now the woman's like, man, look, we're living in, in the new age. I don't yeah. need nobody. I'm doing my own thing. And what happened? Give an example of well, what you happened know, the, you know, when the woman well, did her own thing one time. What, ha what happens is... You know, nowadays with the Skype and the FaceTime and all of those different things that, you know, people are able to bypass the protection that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, has given for them, you know, in order to help uh, uh, facilitate, you know, finding a new mate. And uh, there was one particular story that we had down in Georgia where a, uh, uh, a guy married a, a sister. They had uh, a couple of children and then the young man went missing. And uh, after he went missing, the sister frantically was looking for him and she got a knock at the door after a couple of weeks and uh, it was the police, you know. And um, they said, we're looking for George. And she said, I don't know any George. And they showed a picture and it was her husband. She said, that's not George, that's my husband, so-and-so. And they said, no, this is George. You know, we've been looking for him for so many years you know, maybe four, four or five years, and we just found out where he was at, and uh, we've been wanting him for the murder of his first wife. And so they, sh they showed a picture of his first wife in a chalk line. Chalk and saying, in the chalk line, we know when there's a dead body and there's a chalk line around them, showed, you know, so this young lady had no Wally, she had no one to check, you know, to do the due diligence to find out about who is this person for sure that I'm marrying? You know, did she give herself an opportunity to uh, uh, to find somebody or that's going to be good to her? Maybe he would have done the same thing to her if she would have made him uh, just that mad. Maybe uh, th something would have been worse. Maybe she, he would have killed her or maybe killed, you know, her children as well. So the process that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowed the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to put into place is the Wali system. And the majority of the women nowadays, you know, they get on all of these sites, you know, and they go on the sites, they're talking to the brothers without having uh, a guardian there. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said if there's no guardian and no wali and there's no two witnesses, 
then the marriage is null and void, the marriage is null and void, the marriage is null and void. He said it three times. Aisha radiallahu anha had uh, reported that hadith. So when the women are looking to get married, and it's not just the women because sometimes brothers are good brothers and they end up finding a sister that they should have checked on herself. You know, and we want to be married so bad that we bypass the system, the good system, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowed to be put in place by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So many times we come and, you know, sisters say, well, I don't have a wali, you know, and I don't need one, and I know what I want, and then maybe two weeks later, a month later, you know, then we have to go in and try to save the sister from a bad situation. Or we just had another instance that we had to save a brother from a bad situation because he didn't do what he should have did and go through the process, being patient, you know, with the, uh, with the process and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowed it to be set up. Now you yeah. want to go get a car, you want to rent an apartment, and the people are smart enough not to just give their car to anybody or their house Correct. or anything else of value. They do what's called a credit check. Yeah. So the yeah. person has a great speech, but at the end you're like, man, this guy's great. But then the report comes back. And yet, it's, that he's it's horrible. Been, yeah, he's been doing this to everybody. He goes in, stays in the house for a, a period of time, or he drives the car and then hides the car for about six, seven, eight months, not paying for it. And it's, it's even worse when you have somebody, and I tell the sisters whenever they get ready to get married, just call, let us do our job, you know, so that we can, you know, investigate, you know, do our own personal Islamic detective work to make sure that you're not putting yourself in a bad situation. So we'll call the Wali. We'll make sure that, you know, that, that she has a Wali. If she doesn't, she's not supposed to assign a Wali to herself. She's supposed to go to the Imam. The Prophet Wasallam said that the Imam is the Wali for the one who doesn't have one. You know, so he will either assign the Imam or assign someone or he, do, he will do it. You know, so that, you know, if things are not done right in the beginning, it's going to be very difficult for things to end up wrong. Mm -hmm. You know, just like... Um, you know, the first right of a child. And I asked some of the people who come into the counseling, said, what is the first right of the child? And very seldom anyone has the uh, answer. And the first right of the child is that the father finds them a good mother. That's right. You know, so he's got to do his due diligence. So it's not just trying to find out if the guy is okay, but the guy, the brother, has to find out whether or not the sister uh, is worthy of carrying the seed and then raising those children and being a good model and being the nurturer that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created her to be. That's amazing. You know, one of the misconceptions out of the many, but when people look into this, really, they talk to the Muslim woman, they investigate Islam, they talk to the Muslims, they see that all of these false accusations are actually just a bunch of hogwash. And one of them is that Islam oppresses women. But when you talk to the Muslim women, you see that the majority of people coming into Islam are women and they get to see, I mean, all of these benefits in Islam. And Islam actually is a protection, yes. safeguarding her yes, yes. from any of the pitfall and evils of society. Yeah, and it's very difficult, you know, when somebody's desires and drives and motivations is they want to be married, they want to be married like right now, you know, and they don't want to wait. You know, they make a dua, they pray, it's the kara, you know, and they say they wake up in the morning and see someone and they say, Allah sent them, but they still didn't do the you know, the due diligence to find out if this person is the type of person that's going to be beneficial. And sometimes uh, they may have children or daughters, you know, or sons for that matter, and marry somebody who's got a record of pedophilia or something like that, and they didn't do what they were supposed to do, and they didn't let anybody else do it. And next thing you know, they're in a situation where children are being molested, they're being abused, afraid to even go to their own house, the guy moves in, takes everything they have, and then disappears. Next thing you know, he's on the other side of the country doing the same thing to someone else. And with the Internet, people are allowed to do that. So we tell all of the sisters, be patient. Fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala regarding, you know, what he uh, uh, wants for you and so that you can have a good outcome and a good ending. That's right. Yeah. Tell us right now, people are at the verge of divorce. Yes and they need some assistance, some help, how can they get a hold of you? Well, we have a, a Center for Islamic Counseling and Guidance in Atlanta, Georgia, and we also have one uh, in Houston, Texas, actually two in Houston, Texas. And if you go to, the, uh, to our website, islamiccounseling.org, there's a hotline number there, 
and someone will always answer that phone or they will call you back you know in a short uh, in a short time and we'll be able to set up any type of counseling that you need either via Skype or you come into the office and we could help you with uh, Islamic uh, counseling based on uh, marriage at risk premarital counseling you have teenagers that need help and assistance we can do that kind of work and it's based on what pleases Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Quran and the Sunnah so you actually have a number yes. that people can call on the, on the internet and it's um, 281-917-9026 is the hotline number and someone will always call you back on that line and get you started into having the type of counseling or consultation that you need in order to help you uh, put more structure in your life regarding your marriage and your family. Operator standing by, I think the phone line's going off right all, now. People already, are, people Shaykh, are, people are all calling. Already, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala <laughs> You know, guide all of them to hear the nasiha, you know, and take that uh, information and be better individuals as it pleases Allah. May God Allah. Almighty, the Creator of Allah, reward you for all your wonderful work. Thank you for being with us. Thank, Thank you. you very much, inshallah, Thank for you. inviting me, inshallah. Thank you. Another wonderful guest here on the Dean Show, sharing his experiences, highlighting some of the wonderful work that those who adhere to this way of life are doing out there in the world, trying sincerely to make the world, the community, a better place. and one part of the story that we were talking about in the beginning, his experiences was with people who finally now, they got away from the rat race of life. They were locked down in an environment now that they had to be forced and think. They thought, what is the purpose of life? Why am I here? And they started to investigate all the different religions. Why don't you do the same? Well, you're not forced to be locked up, chained down, and then you start to look and think, or you don't even get that opportunity. Death comes to you, and now you didn't even get a chance to really reflect and think. And now, you got two things staring in front of you on a day of judgment, paradise, hellfire. You didn't prepare for nothing of the next life. So what can you expect out of the next life? Wonderful rewards of it? No, because you, you went and enjoyed all of the blessings that the Creator has given you. You denied all the signs. One is coming to you right now. So really ponder and think, why am I here? What's the meaning of all of this? Did God just create this and just in play, and then I die, I'm dust, I go to sleep, boom, wake up to another reality, wake up before it's too late. Think. Call us if you have any questions. 1-800-662-ISLAM. Let's look at the other alternative, what Islam has to say about the purpose of life. And you'll be fascinated on all of the evidence it provides, how it goes with the common sense that God Almighty has given you to differentiate truth from falsehood. And a whole new world of goodness will open up if you're sincere and you're wanting to know what it is that I'm here for in this life. And we'll see you next time. Subscribe if you haven't. Do it right now. Do it right now. And share. Share the Dean Show with everybody, friends, family, and the world. We'll see you next time. Until then, peace be with you.